Yeah, so as I was listening to your uh, presentation, I was thinking that there is a particular figure that is emerging in this uh, corporate wellness programs, and that is the figure of the ideal employee. What, what kind of ideal employee is, uh, you know, we are dealing with? Um, and a lot of it is about this ideology of engagement, participation, uh, being active, being a team player, uh, and being connected, uh, as you mentioned before. But when you look at the reality of it, actually it is really hard to get people to engage, to get people to, to, to live up to that ideal figure uh, of the connected, active team player employee. Um, and it's also led me to a question, well, to what extent, I mean, these um, schemes are voluntary and cast in a way that is really about choice rather than about control? And how much of it is really imposed? Because if companies are realizing they're spending, they're investing in the schemes, but then employees are not really responding in the way they anticipated. So do you see maybe the future of the schemes become becoming more of a an imposition, uh, an imperative rather than a choice, like slipping from the internalized norms towards back again, the authoritarian kind of impulse uh, of control. And this is a, a question for the three of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll go briefly, yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, I think the uh, yeah for me, the ideal employee is something along those lines, as you said, the kind of connected, active um, team player, this kind of thing. But there's also there's this there's this notion in management, uh, well, it comes from psychology, I think, of flow, mm. the notion of flow. Um, and I've got a definition of it somewhere, but it, it's something along the lines of being in this absolute state of in total engagement and kind of self-forgetfulness, sort of like being in, in the zone as a, like as a, as a sports player. Um, and I, so I think that is, again, kind of the ideal that, that gets talked about. And these are seen as ways of, of, of enabling that. Um, but I think they, they do remain on the level of ideals and no one really expects them to be in this implemented but it is it's kind of like a, a utopian thing it's always kind of in the distance um and, and but all those things are kind of connected with that and um for me in in terms of this uh, i'll just mention about seeing in terms of what bernard steve talks about as as programming as a sense of kind of programming through psychopolitics um all of these kinds of systems um are engaged on that level of psychopolitics of kind of reprogramming or, or programming our consciousness in various ways to to think in terms of that so th those ideals might not be re um, achievable in reality but they're kind of there to uh, something to, to compare ourselves against um all of the in terms of being voluntary all of the ones uh, all the, the the organizations it was about 10 organizations i spoke to it was all voluntary in there and i've not heard about it being imposed in the uk i think um it's either imposed or almost imposed, and maybe in some cases in the United States, I think, mm -hmm. it, BP and some for others. Insurance yeah, exactly, for insurance reasons. So it, I think whether it's going to be imposed on it is probably going to become textual, depending on those particular situations. I, I couldn't, in, in the cases I was looking at, I couldn't see it being imposed, um, purely for, for the kind of the reasons I outlined that it wasn't really, they weren't really that interested. The, in the cases I was looking at, which is really interesting in contrast with uh, what uh, Phoebe and Lukash were talking about, is that they weren't really even interested in the data. Uh, I, I thought, oh, this would be great. They're going to be really data hungry and seeing what they can do. They weren't really interested. Um, it, was almost, it was almost a marketing exercise, an internal marketing exercise. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the, the employer brand kind of idea. Um, they didn't actually do anything with the data. The only way that they used the data, you tended to get some data back from these companies like Virgin and, and GCC and then presented it to their sort of board or their management to say, oh, look, this, this is how great it is. You should fund it for next year. Um, so, uh, but they admitted that it was just, it, they didn't really get what it meant. They didn't really, really interest it. It was just a way of justifying spending on the, on the project. Um, so when you say a marketing strategy, is it a marketing for the employer or for um, the self trucking industries? Um, uh, sorry, yeah, just really briefly. Yeah, yeah, just okay. the employer to the employees. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, that's, I mean, what's really interesting, we didn't actually explain how the company set out to carry this project. One thing is to say it's a multinational corporation and uh, they do 
um, they, they do kind of, they, well basically they work with clients to find really big spaces, to so Coca-Cola for example, IBM work with this company, to find the right kinds of spaces to set up um, wherever they, they've decided to kind of set up shop. Um, but another feature, and the smaller medium enterprise that, that we worked, that, that was integrated into the, to the bigger company, uh, was also worked in human resource activities and workplace design initiatives themselves. So it's quite interesting kind of uh, paradox there in the sense that uh, this company, w as they joined the bigger company, which I won't name, but you can easily find it because we've actually put the project, we've put up a report uh, for the company on their website. So they've not told us to be anonymous, but we thought we would just leave it out of the paper. Uh, but anyway, they decided that I in joining the bigger company, they would use this quantified workplace experiment as a way of saying, this is what we have to offer you. We're on the cutting edge. We have these new interesting workplace designs to offer you the bigger real estate company. Um, but so what they said in running the project is that they were developing a product, which is very interesting. So when we came in as the independent social scientist and behavioral psychologist, is we made it very clear, okay, so what we'd like to do is the observational methodology that we're looking at what you're working on, we're gonna report on it, as it were, everything was agreed, absolutely fine. Um, and I think that, that that adds another interesting dimension to the employment relationship that we didn't, I didn't mention particularly here, but it's about opting in and opting out. Um, there's recent research in the legal, uh, in le legal literature that, that talks about stigmatization and whether or not you know, people will, be, uh, will, be inv will become involved over time because they feel like they're left out if they don't. So there's a, a new pressure that begins to emerge. Um, so that's already been documented, and of course in psychological literature as well. But I think what's interesting for us is the way that that these uh, that the employee, as a supposed well, so there's something called the wellness syndrome that Cedarstrom and Spicer have written about, very interesting stuff um, coming out of City University's business school. Um, and and what it what it what it refers to is that you know the the healthiest employee is seen as the ideal one. Now questions around discrimination again, bringing back to legal questions. Um, you know, discrimination, uh, e equality of opportunity, uh, and there is very little that's been done so far uh, in terms of what your rights are so far in that context. Um, so the healthiest worker is supposedly the ideal worker. And then the next thing to, uh, that I'll finish on is to talk about the intimacy that, that we referred to a little bit uh, that's also linked to this mythology of work that Fleming's writes about to do with the self. Obviously, Nicholas Rose, a couple of the papers that have, you know were circulated for today. And I think what we are talking about is the next stage of that. And I really think about the facilitation of the technology and how uh, itself. So I think that's what, what we're kind of interested in is how that oh, entire, and that's where neoliberalism can be understood. So what, what do we mean by neoliberalism? There's a whole literature you can read on that. But the way that we refer, or I refer to it, and in this paper, is more to do with uh, the new uh, abilities to to uh, the new invasion of every level of the individual as a worker. And meanwhile, we have this whole question of self-management because we, we can actually collaborative work. That's also s quite ideal. So fine, actually one more thing in terms of ag agility. Okay, so the she Sheffield uh, Work Psychology Group, and this is linked to some stuff as we mentioned already today too, is that, that the projects that were carried out to see to what extent the new agility model is helping productivity, their findings demonstrated actually that it was because people are working together, it's that collaboration, it's because again of the relationship uh, with, your, uh, with your colleagues, da, da, da. that's what improves productivity, which is fascinating. So, so the experiments and the studies that are being run right now that we're asking a lot of bigger questions around, is this gonna turn into something that's required? What does this mean? C you know, will you have this control relationship that reminds us of you know what they were fantasizing in Taylor or in the factory and mental and manual labors again, sort of co you know separated. Um, but yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I would like to pick up on the notion uh, of self-management, which came up in both pre presentation and also what you've just said, Phoebe, about uh, this idea of uh, invasion, because it seems to me that the actualization of uh, self-management, as you said, requires an increase in integration of work and life, and thereby a sense of um, blurring of boundaries between the sphere of privacy and intimacy and the sphere of labor. So I wonder, in your empirical work and your interviews and surveys with uh, the employees, are they in any sense aware of that invasion of that blurring of those lines between their personal life and their work life? Um, and if so, how do they, do they handle that? How do you react to it? Um, 
Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't talk about it. I, I've done some um, interviews and focus groups with workers. I've not properly analysed them yet. Um, but they there was some awareness of that. Um, there, in the, in the, the various people I spoke to, there was a few people who were kind of, who had started out using it and then started to feel quite negative about it for that kind of reason. They were in, they were in a minority. Most people, maybe it's kind of a self-selecting group of people who actually volunteered for this who were quite enthusiastic about it. Um, they were actually quite positive about that blurring um, in the sense that they were, they were they thought it was good, that it was something they could be doing, it, um, walking the dog in the morning, um, but also that it, it legitimised um, conducting exercise in work time as well, to an extent, to an extent, um, and, do, and doing slightly more creative things like having walking meetings and, and this kind of stuff. Um, and, but this was only in certain cases when sort of ma there was sort of management buy-in on it. Um, and when it was very much kind of pushed by management. And I think to kind of link to something that I think, uh, Phoebe was mentioning before, I think that the, the ideal worker and the healthy person, uh, healthy subject um, aligning it. And I think we can see this because of uh, where I think there's a, an increasing management culture which is built around health. Um, where like probably everyone's managers here is probably running a triathlon or a marathon um, or something like this. You know, like, you know, like uh, talk about uh, marathons or cycling is the new golf. You know, th th it's this, this kind of healthy subject which is kind of being pushed. But um, in one case, someone was um, extremely critical of their manager who had said, um, you know, this, this is a really great project. You should be doing this. But, um, and I know everyone's busy, but you should make time for this. And they've said, well, maybe you should give me some more time. You know, uh, it, it, it's because they're overstressed and overworked. And so the, the, there, was, there was a bit of a pushback about it like that, I found. But actually, mostly people were just quite kind of positive about it. Parrot, parrot, okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, one of the first things I was said to, to it is that the, the main problem was that the project was so badly set up in a way that really, I don't think that they had a major problem with this, in a sense, uh, and, until some, Phoebe began to say more, because Phoebe was conducting all the interviews. Um, but from just a sort of perspective of setting up experiment, it was almost like giving people a weight scales and asking them, could you please now lose weight, and not providing any sort of um, any support or any kind of technical. So in this sense, really, um, it, it, was, it was coming really short. Um, um, Phoebe, you want to say more about the uh, responses? To um, only that the dissemination from the project that we're, we've been funded to do is to design, in fact, an uh, agreeable work design model that can be potentially useful for other companies who are interested in this kind of, and we've learned quite a lot so far, so just that, that one thing is that employees respond in different ways, and one thing that you've really got to be careful to do is set it up in a way that that dialogue is there, um, uh, the Institute for Adva for Quantified Self in Groningen at Hansa University has also been doing a lot of work um, on looking at coaching. And the final thing that, that I'll say as well is that, in okay, so one of the employees working at the company in Rotterdam herself is um, an Olympic judo master. And she obviously is going to set a standard, if you, if you like. So in all the interviews, um, she was the only one who said to me, well, I need to slow down my steps. I need to stop moving around so much which is fascinating. Most employees were really on side, really excited. Yes, I'd like to be involved with this, da, da, da. But they weren't clear on what, it, what the link was to work. So that was one thing. So I think that's something that's being developed right now. So it's interesting. Thank you. Maybe uh, one last point before we pass it to the audience uh, is to do with this meaning-making machine that is uh, the, um, this wellness programs, uh, which seems to me quite paradoxical because at the end of the day, what they are dealing with or producing or using as method is actually numbers and algorithms and data. Um, so how do you see this transition from something that is purely algorithmic and datified to something that can actually uh, provide meaning and imbue uh, employees with uh, meaning for their work uh, and encourage them to relate to their job in a different, more meaningful way? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think there is a, there is a certain meaning in numbers, in, even in the, in the kind of the uh, dataism that, uh, that Jill um, mentioned that um, data's mean mean objectivity or transparency or something like that. Um, and so, and people did talk about uh, the, the the employees I spoke to did talk about like that. Oh, it's it and it, it objectifies it, and so that that uh, it changed seemed to change their relationship to um, to their exercise activities if they weren't used to doing that. Um, so I think I think there is on on that level, but I think it, I, I think it's just working on on different levels, uh, and so it's the sort of the existence of the project um, or the programs 
um, generates a certain meaning, you know, that kind of employer brand kind of idea. Um, but also, um, I, 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 I kind of like to think about the, the, these the devices as forming a sort of socio-technical assemblage, which sort of, which um, helps to manage flows of um, um, flows of meaning in, in a certain way. It may, it makes you kind of enge- or encourages you to engage in certain kinds of ways. And I, I think what's interesting to explore, which I'd like to do further, is what kinds of subjects are kind of assumed in in, in this process. Um, and for me, I think um, the object, the, the, the perceived object objectivity is important, but it's also is that connection with others, and it's how it kind of flows from one person or uh, within networks, really. Uh, when people are uh, kind of pushing them out there and you know around those kind of hashtags that I was looking at, who's actually um, and in what ways are they controlling the kind of the meaning in that network? Even it might be on a, a very minute basis. It might just be, I walked loads of steps today. You should do it too. Yeah. But it's kind of pushing that around a kind of a network, and then and it doesn't necessarily engage us. As I said, not very much on the subjective, sort of discursive level. It's just kind of there. It's just a little nudge. So it's uh, it, 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 the, the power of it is supposedly in the, that kind of nudge approach is that it's kind of below the level of meaning almost, um, or kind of conscious meaning. Affective. Yeah, affective, exactly, yeah. Um, I couvent agree more uh, with, with uh, Chris' evaluation, and uh, to add to it, um, I think we are in a, such an early stage, especially for this kind of uh, work environments, white collar, or the environment that we're working in, when evaluation of the something such a, as productivity or a work outcome is so much more complex than, for example, in a more kind of algorithmic, uh, factory-based uh, context where you can, in more, let's say, a bit more easy way, measure the the, the outcomes. Um, so in this sense, we are really just scratching the surface with the tracking technology because we all have different cognitive style, all have different personality, the way, the beliefs, the way we work, the way we engage with particular tasks. And as I showed there, the meaning of productivity is very different for all of us. So be, those things have to be o- somehow operational, standardized, before we have even moved to thinking about the way how we can actually track, keep track of it, and based on this tracking, make a judgment that will be then imp- embedded into uh, a sort of workflows. And well, when we get to this stage, then the discussion will shift into th- this kind of more authoritarian and dangerous topics, but I guess that hopefully will um, have some things, safe, some some sort of safeguards set up by that time. Great, thank you very much. So I would like now to open it up to uh, the audience for you to ask questions. So my colleague here will kindly pass the microphone. Hi, thanks for fascinating talks. Um, so I was wondering a bit more about the role of the people who make the devices, because um, our university had one of these wellness programs, um, but they're, I don't know, not very... <laughs> they um, we they wanted us to pay 40 euros for the, th- for the gadget, and like I didn't sign up, because come on. Um, it would, it's interesting, though, in seeing... I mean, it was the administrative staff that actually did get involved. The, the professors were like... Psh- and um, I now know our research um, admin person has an average of 35,000 steps a day, which is interesting. So you do learn something about other sides of people, right, than you would have otherwise. But but in this case, it very much seemed like this is an initiative. This is like the university can now tick something off on their, on their you know, health and safety um, reports. And it's really coming from outside. Just it's, it's sort of not really integral to the to the workplace very much. And I wonder if, if that was your experience too. It would be fascinating to hear from more interviews with people who weren't participants too. Yeah, yeah, so um, it, it, it differed in different workplaces and a couple of the, um, um, participant organisations of mine were, were universities, and also my university did it, and, and it was very similar. It was mostly the administrative stuff, um, and that's because I think kind of lecturers, professors, aren't really around very much. Um, but also then, and it, but then it was those kind of lower grade stuff, the kind of cleaners and porters and cafe workers, which weren't engaged. And as one person quite frequently said, they work around all day, so they probably don't need these kind of interventions. Which of course, if we look at socio demographics, they're more likely to be unhealthy in various different ways, but they might walk around a lot. Um, which is which is interesting, I think, um, and yeah, so I think it was 
the, the, why I kind of frame, partly why I frame it in terms of activity is because a lot of the, the whole emphasis of this has been on tackling sedentarism, right? The kind of people sitting too much. Um, and that is actually only the case for certain certain kind of groups of workers. Um, and these programs are, I mean, certainly like the big corporate ones, like the Virgin one, the GCC one I mentioned, they are just bought in and kind of implemented. They kind they say that they, they come and kind of integrate to your workplace, but they don't really because it's the same for everyone, really. Um, and I think that is because I think that is about managing, it's about like, managing that relationship and they kind of see it in the same way as uh, providing maybe subsidized gym membership or um, uh, whatever else they do as part of their wellness programs. Um, and uh, as you say, like, yeah, we have this thing in the UK, you can get an award for being an um, investor in people, um, which a lot of these did and, and it, this was part of it. But in other contexts, um, it was kind of maybe was slightly not necessarily integrated with the work practices, but in one uh, they'd also got lots of awards for um, environmental um, initiatives. And they, they, it was part of their sort of green strategy because it encouraged people to work, walk rather than um, drive to work. And in one case, they'd actually paid for um, paid for the devices for people out of uh, a grant that they were uh, a, like a green grant they won. Um, but they didn't. Interesting, they didn't tell the the, uh, the staff that. Um, that that's how it was funded. Um, and it wasn't presented to the staff at all as an environmental thing. It was just as a, an individual thing of you can be fitter and healthier. And I, I thought I found that kind of strange. I thought actually that maybe would engage people, but they didn't seem to think so. They, they, um, so that's how they sold it. That's how I got the money for it, but they actually pushed it to the, the staff in a different way. Um, this is a really, really interesting, Jill. It's, it's made me think. Um, and in the context of our company, so just I've tried to break it down into the types of uh, participants, and uh, a lot of the consultants got involved. But then again, that's I think that really brings in the tensions to do with cognitive work again, um, because it's a, uh, one of the shifts of, sort of neo Taylorism is that we that there it's it's seen as quite difficult, and actually Drucker ca calls sort of knowledge work something that's not in immediately able to be sort of valued and quantified in the same type of way. So once we get to that level, you start to ask new kinds of questions. But despite that, it's, it's again, what is the question that we're asking? So I think the consultants were talking to me and saying, uh, you know, and I'm an outsider, so I could kind of hear what their, you know, feelings were about, about how the project was both set up by the company and also what they thought that the kind of possible results would be. Um, there was some skepticism. There were other questions to do with why are we doing this and also why don't we have a coach? But going into the kind of questions around having a coach, I wonder whether that kind of brings about questions to do with what the quantified self is, because the way I understand it, um, the way that I think, well, you know, Chris Dancy, the most quantified man in the world, da da da, he's got a great quote, and he talks about if that data is knowable, the person who knows it better be you. And he's quite, he's quite an innovator, and from the beginning of the, the kind of the movement, um, has I think been really super kind of, uh, uh, what's the word for it, insightful, because he's saying, okay, this is fine, but you have to recognize that this is about yourself and your own awareness as you have access to this new kind of massive, it's big data, and people forget that. There's a whole politics around accessibility to that level, that data is so rich, and okay, it has existed to some extent, and I mean, that's what Taylor wanted, right? He and Gilbreth both wanted that data. Now we have the possibilities here. And I'm not a determinist, I'm not saying, oh, it's because we now have this technology, da, da, da. but it is about our relationship with technology, again, and all the post-humanist questions, oh, does this mean, and, and then, of course, nobody's asked it yet, but you're probably all thinking it, what about automation, you know, da, da, da. are the robots going to take our jobs, and, and if so, does that mean we have to work better with these machines, and is that actually what we're doing by re becoming healthier, blah. Okay, um, I think that was all I was going to say, really, but I think people are f sometimes and the employees that we worked with, for whatever reason, didn't quite click that this is a personal um, journey and that if you are using it at work, which most people only did, so there you go. So is that is the fact that you're using this, uh, and, and the, the questions around am I working better with my colleagues? We also got that in the first range of interviews. Yes, it is changing relationships with my colleagues. Why is that? We have on the dashboard so we can see what our colleagues, how many steps they're taking, we can kind of pull together, we can all climb Mount Everest together, these kinds of questions. Um, but what is the bigger question, I guess, is what people kept asking me. But um, Great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I know we've got Pauli there. Uh, I have a cur curiosity. Did you experience any case of cheaters or people who have been cheating in, in your, your case study? 
Um, my father-in-law did. <coughs> He's very. <laughs> he, 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 no, he accidentally put it in the washing machine. That's what it was. And then he said, oh, I've claimed claim it. But no, that's a phenomenon that is happening yeah. where you give it to your brother, and that's well known now. And it, of course, it kind of messes up yeah, the data. Uh, we, I don't think anybody confessed, quote unquote, to doing it. Um, but it was a joke. Um, it didn't, didn't get anyone conf yeah yeah it didn't get anyone confess uh, to doing it but I, I asked about that as a as a phenomenon was that, was that a problem did it um, was trust an issue and um, the people who were involved in implementing the programs they said yeah I mean possibly people do they they, they, they did sometimes there were some systems for just checking to see if people were doing ridiculous uh, amounts of steps that seemed out, out of track but they said that actually that wasn't that wasn't really the issue anyway they didn't really. Um, they, and that actually it was it was it was always about yourself anyway. You're only cheating yourself, and actually it was a, like with those points. It's it's about measuring yourself against yourself. So it's pointless, and it doesn't mean anything. You don't you know there's little prizes, but it's nothing really significant. But it's an insurance company question as well, isn't it? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And again, that, that's obviously that's in the UK, but in 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 other contexts, yeah, where with workplace health insurance, of course, that might be that, that could be different. I, I've not. Uh, you know, studied that at all, so I couldn't really say. But um, yeah, it wasn't it just wasn't really seen as being a, a big problem. There was a couple of people mentioned. Oh, yeah, uh, there was some people who seemed to have suspiciously high. It kind of it was they kind of a bit pissed off. But yeah, we also had quite a long period from which we captured this data a year long. So even if there were any cheaters in some points, they, they couldn't maintain it for the entire <laughs> period of a year. So I guess that this, in a data sort of perspective, no, we didn't really kind of see it in a data as well. Okay, perhaps one last quick question, because I guess our quantified stomach is uh, rumbling at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just curious, picking up on what you just said there about the U.S. context, right, where there's a much more direct financial incentive for the employer to increase employee wellness in order to reduce healthcare expenditure costs, right? So that's a very clear-cut association between employer employee behavior and employer benefit. But I'm wondering, in outside the U.S. context, how explicit in the minds of both the employer and the employee is this relationship or perceived relationship among physical activity, physical movement, the thing that is being measured, as an operationalization of intellectual work, productivity, um, engagement, all of those sort of cognitive affective terms, and the relationship between sort of the moral good, right? To be a good person is to be healthy, is to be engaged, is to have meaning in work or to do meaningful work. And so that sort of triangle among cognitive affective moral imperative and sort of physical activity, the thing that is actually being quantified, how explicitly are those relationships discussed or are they not? I, th I think it's a very good question and I think it's a part of a bigger question about how in general are we aware of the context in which the data that's generated can tell stories about us and we, again, all of us who are sitting here continuously right now are generating digital traces of our behavior, whether it's pushing your laptop key or uh, lo registering your location in your smartphone, even the simple point, your location with the smartphone already tells a story about you. You are in here in Denmark in this university campus that profiles your sociodemographically in particular way. And again, we only scratching the surface right now. I'm, right now, for example, I'm looking at publicly available Strava data. So data produced by one of the most popular apps used by cyclists. I'm looking at about million data points, million trips generated around the Bristol and Bath area by around about 20,000 people over across three years. And it's mind blowing how much information I'm able to get about these particular individuals, both sociodemographically by even going deeper and testing a simple hypothesis about, for example, classifying them by speed and as trying to infer, I'm using epidemiology approaches to this, I'm using some machine learning. There are techniques that have been used for a long time in those other disciplines that we can now bring here and the, the potential is in a way scary and we really don't realize fully the, the scope of this. I guess that's that's a kind of a, let's say, bigger question um, uh, there embedded in your, your question, in a sense. Uh, 
yeah yeah a really interesting point as well and um I, th- I think in the in the context I looked at, it was mostly about the 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 um, the emotional, the, the kind of the value, um, rather than actually seeing any direct relation. It, it's more that there was an assumption of a connection between sort of productivity and hardline kind of productivity and healthy people. But I think it was much more of a moralistic um, discourse. And it's, I mean, sometimes in kind of some reports of like GCC and Virgin reports, they produce reports and they like to say that you can see this percentage increase in productivity, um, you know, and in this kind of thing, and you can calculate the return on investment in this way. And you, see, you get kind of government reports that say, you know, a healthier workforce can increase productivity, this percentage, this kind of thing. I assume these numbers are largely like, fabricated. But um, I don't know how you could kind of quantify that, and certainly not quantifying creative work um, in that kind of way. But yeah, I, I think I think that, that that connection is important, but it's actually, the, the really, it's, it's a moralistic one. Okay, well, on that note, uh, I would like to invite you all to lunch downstairs and to thank again our panelists for fantastic presentations.